Okay, imagining after capitalism. So this was, builds nicely off of what George was saying. So first book I read in the future, um, back in the 1980s, was this tome called The Image of the Future. It's a classic in the field. And the author, Fred Pollock, basically studied historical civilizations and said the most successful civilizations of the past, one of the common elements was they had a sort of unified image of their future. And it, uh, the basic argument of the book was today, now today was 1970 when he was writing that. Actually, you could argue even earlier, but to say 1970. He's saying, what the problem in 1970 is we don't have that unified image anymore and we're kind of lost. And obviously it's 50 years later, if my math is right, and we're still there. We don't have that unified image of the future. So being a futurist and being closer to the end than the beginning, I said, well, why don't I take a crack at it, right, and just see? what? Well, maybe, there, maybe there is something out there, right? And about 10 years ago, at a symposium much like this, my students and I, we, we put together a symposium on uh, after capitalism to just start goofing around. So 10 years ago, I started playing with this, and then you know how it is. It takes about 10 years to put ideas down on paper. So... To get to that image thing, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about how we got there. That might help, because I know we want to say, you know, how do futurists think about the future? So one really simple, I love this slide. I mean, if I had one slide to take to the, uh, take to the, uh, uh, to the moon, I think I'd bring this one with me. But it talks about, we think in terms of three time horizons, and this idea of the image, uh, this image of the future that Pollock was talking about is really this third horizon idea. But let's start at the first, the current operating system current rules of the game, whatever domain or topic we're looking at, how does it work, right? So in this case, capitalism, what are the rules of the current game? So we, we kind of understand how neoliberal capitalism works. That's horizon one. We know that over time, eventually the, the, operating, the current operating system degrades and new systems start, new candidates emerge to replace that, new ideas. So horizon two is kind of like the battleground for new ideas. We're going to come back to that three horizons idea, but keep that in mind. First horizon, current system starts at a grade. Second horizon, competing ideas for what might be next. They kind of battle it out. Third horizon, new system. Okay. So how do we get there? So a little bit on the research methodology. One of the things that we like to do is, in our particular approach to the future is we say, all right, if we're going to understand the future of a domain or topic, let's map it. Let's create a visual map. So now, obviously, we're not going to get into the details here, but in the terms of um, we use this tool called Coggle to put it together, but we basically organize it around ideas about the first horizon, ideas about the second, ideas about the third. And as futurists, we do something called horizon scanning, which is we look for signals of change. So we use the domain map to say, all right, if we're going to, if you will, explore the future, the domain map is kind of our guide. And we use that as, think of it as search terms to say, all right, what is changing in this domain of capitalism? What are the new ideas? We gather those ideas together in a scanning library. And we use a little a free, soft, a cl free cloud-based software called Digo. Over the last uh, you know, seven to ten years, have been cap just capturing these signals of change in this scanning library. And you can see some of the topics that have been popping, right? So signals is all this, the, the, the new stuff that's happening. You see ideas, circular commons, UBI. So it gives you some sense of uh, what's popping. And you can see one entry here on China's commitment to the circular economy. And it gives you an idea. So the, the scanning library captures just really broad signals of change. Give us some ideas what's happening based on our map, right? The other thing that, we did, that I did for this particular topic was, said, all right, what have people said about the future of after capitalism? So really what I'm presenting is a work of synthesis. So... Again, trying to think of if we can build, yeah, thanks. Uh, if, we, if we can, if we want to build these images of the future that we can, uh, that we see as positive images of the future to sort of aspire to, what have people said? And you can see I, I ended up about capturing about 52 of them in terms of like these are really good ones. They have a pretty substantial, they make a pretty substantial statement about the, uh, future of after capitalism it may not be that might not have been the whole topic of the book but there was sub, uh, there was enough in there that it's well, kind of juicy um and probably looked at three times that and these are the ones that kind of if you will made the cut 
Now, we're more interested in the left-hand column, the, the images, right? Now, the reason I put the Horizon 2, the, one of the major themes in this research was there are way more ideas about how to fix capitalism than to create something new. Probably not a surprise, but there's so, there's so many reforming capitalism ideas out there. So I said, meh, it's, it's just doing an injustice. Because in a way, these are almost like transition ideas. Because they're saying, yeah, we know there's something wrong with capitalism. We need to, we need to do something, but we, we don't want to take the leap into the unknown. So let's see if we can fix it. And there's a lot of those. Okay, so I captured some, what I thought were some of the more useful ones, right? And then for each of those 50-ish images, I did a little uh, put together a little template to, anal to analyze each of them. So uh, we don't have that sort of, you know, we're, we're playing with ideas about the future. So we try to be as, you know, as rigorous as we can be from a, uh, an analysis standpoint. But, you know, so we had some, we had a way to compare what are, you know, how do each of these different images compare to one another? All right, they're really pieces of images, right? I call them concepts, right? What's kind of interesting, one of the things that Pollock said, you see down the bottom, you have ideals, emotional, spiritual aspects, per personal aspects. So one of the things that he was saying about the successful, compelling images of the future is they had this, they, they got you somehow. Like you, you looked at you said, I want that. And it kind of appealed, it has that sort of intuitive appeal. So it's not this sort of dry economic plan, of, but it's just like, I want to go there. And so there's a lot of that element in... I guess, in a successful image. So something that we really look for. Again, again, you can imagine all the empirical people going, oh my God, what? Right? But that's, no. that's what the data says. It's, it's that human aspect, I guess. Okay. The other thing, George pointed out that any good scenario technique tip typically narrows down on a set of driving forces. It says, in this domain, what's making it go? I mean, what are those forces of change that are really shaping that future? And there's all kinds of different ways you can then tell the stories, but I ended up settling on about seven of them. And if I had a full hour, I'd give you the, the, this, the seven, but we're just going to have to um, skip that. And, but you can, you can, I mean, you can look at that and kind of... The only one that might be a little confusing, maybe, the ineffective left, and that's a little bit more of a us -y thing than... than uh, I tried to look globally. It's a little bit U.S. centric, but in the U.S., in a, in a nutshell, the right versus the, the right is really smart about telling their story, and the left just isn't. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. And it's a real it's it's a real issue. Anyway, we'll leave it at that. It's a that's a fun beer conversation if anyone wants to have it tonight. Um, but it's a factor in the future, right? The right is all right. So remember one more kind of setup, right? So that's a real brief uh, summary of 10 years of research, right? But um, so this, that first horizon starts to degrade. Now, one of the things that I didn't come into the research with this assumption, but I am now 100% on board that capitalism is done. It, you can't be, it can't be saved, right? Now, I, I don't, not everyone's going to be there yet, but when you look at it, it's like, ooh, there's just too many structural problems. And it's just a matter of timing. Now, again, that's not a super controversial statement, but I think the timing is probably faster than we thought. Now, I'll say one, one observation from starting this in 2012. There was a few pieces here and there about, well, capitalism maybe isn't so great. And I think, I don't know, about five, three to five years ago, kaboom, it exploded. I mean, every day of the week now, there's a capitalism is done piece. I mean... Yeah, I, I look at your daily news feed, there's something in there now. And I'm saying only five years before that, it was very rare to see it. So it is, you, you can just watch the, the spike in. Now, of course, the whole setup for this is even though there's this thing, this sense that capitalism is no good, we have no ideas on what to replace it with. There's nothing, not nothing, but you know what I mean? There's nothing coherent. There's nothing coherent. So anyway, that's an assumption. You may not believe it. I didn't start that way, but I'm like, yeah. And it's, it's basically just a structural problem. There's, there's a few other things, but there's a structural problem. 
there's a value, there's all oh, this problem. It just doesn't fit anymore. And the way I like to say this, and I've, I've, I've blogged about it, is like, I don't, I'm not one of those, capitalism is evil and capitalism is, I don't think that's the right approach. It's like, look, it was a system that fit its time. The time has, the context has shifted and it no longer fits. So in other words, job well done. Let's not like tack it. Let's just say it did its job. It, it, it got us to, to where we are today, but it just doesn't fit anymore and we need a new thing. So it's not that capitalism is evil and I see a lot of that and I think, oof, that's, that's not, it's unnecessarily antagonistic. It was, it, again, it just doesn't fit anymore. That's all. It's a simple proposition. Okay. So if it doesn't fit anymore, what else? All right. So the images of after capitalism. A little bit more setup. And oh, this is going to generate some good questions, I think. All right. So you think back to, we're back to our three horizons, right? Current way, transition, the new system, right? So one of the, one of the techniques we use at Houston, um, it's actually a, a, an adaptation from a Hawaii, our, our fellows at Hawaii that put, put together an archetype approach. An archetype approach basically says when you look at, when you go back and look at historically, all the scenario, the scenario projects that have been done, and you say, how did it actually play out? You find that there are patterns. How do systems change over time? So there's a you know there's a data there's a body of data, and it says like these are the typical patterns and how domains or topics play out. So one pattern is continuity. Now I we used to make the joke that the we call it the baseline. That's the continuity future, where you basically um, kind of what George was saying about extrapolation. No major surprises. Just everything keeps kind of going. We used to joke that that was the least likely future, but I'm not so sure anymore. So as an example, we've done recently done some research to try to you know to try to validate this model or at least support it. Maybe validate's a strong word. And we've looked at 78 historical sets of scenarios. And over time, and said, you know, how did, did we, we, we found 78 sets that would fit this archetype model, right? We looked, at how, we, we looked at how they actually played out. And we're finding that the world or the domain seem to be stuck in this baseline way longer than we thought. Now, where everybody here, if you paid any attention to future stuff, what's the number one thing? Change, right? Everything's changing so fast, we can't even keep up with it anymore. We're, we're, we're like, oh my God, it's so painfully slow. It's, it's, it's boring. And the only reason it seems like it's so fast is we don't, we don't, in a sense, we're not watching. So if you're a futurist, you're watching. And it's freaking boring because it takes forever for things to change. So, again, you'll see a whole lot of, like, YouTube keynotes about the speed of technology is unprecedented. You know, it's like, oh, my God, the AI is here. We've been talking about AI for 50 years, folks. 50, I was so sick of AI. I mean, you know, it's changed a little bit, right? But there are so many topics that we've talked about, like self-driving vehicles, where do they come from? I, I worked in the self-driving vehicle project in 1992. <laughs> I mean, this thing has been around forever. All right. So the basic point here to make is, I think, that actually continuity, we used to make fun of it, but it actually seems to be stronger than we thought. That's at least what the data is saying. Change takes a really long time. And then what, if you, if you think about it, ultimately we're trying to get to this transformation, right, in Horizon 3. We're trying to get to a new system. The old system's falling apart. What's the goal? Get to a new system. And what we're saying is it seems like these two other patterns, collapse and new equilibrium, are the major pathways to that new system. Now, we would have thought, uh, we all, I don't know if we actually took a poll or not, but as a team, when we're doing the research, we thought, well, the most common route to a new system is the old one collapses. Wouldn't you? I mean, would you? I would have guessed that, right? How do we get there? We need a crisis. True change only happens when there's a, you know, there's a mega crisis, and that's what finally inspires us to change. That's, that was my belief. We looked at our 78 sets, and we found that by far, new equilibrium was a more common pattern. And new equilibrium is basically, well, new normal is the pop, it's like the pop term for that. But it says there's a challenge to the existing system. So a disruption, a disruption comes, the new system goes, ah, change, yikes. And it accommodates that change, but tries to keep its integrity, the basic integrity intact. So 
And what we found is what typically happens in this, on this road to transformation is there might be multiple new equilibriums before we get to this new system. So there might be multiple start to change, pull back, start to change, pull back, start to change, pull back. And we're, we're still puzzled. We, maybe the data set's just too small. Why there isn't more collapse to transformation? Maybe because you can't dig out of collapse? Maybe it's how we're defining, you know, maybe it's how we define the terms. Not sure yet. Anyway, all right, so those are the patterns, right? And the patterns map along the three horizons. And I think, so we've, we've goofed around, uh, you know, Houston, right? We had to put a cowboy hat in there. And this is the basic way that we're, one of our techniques that we use to map out the future. So how does, new, how does after capitalism go on that? All right, so the baseline, neoliberal capitalism, declining. The new equilibrium, we thought there's like, Sorry, let's put it all up there. I'm not going to go into it, but I found like basically three kind of scenario, mini scenario narratives about what that new equilibrium transi uh, transition might be look might look like. There's a whole bunch of ideas about how we could make capitalism more sustainable. Called that sustainability transition, the sharing stuff. All right, and then the, um, the there's also collapse versions of how we could get there. Okay, mm, whatever. Y you can probably make, you know, overshoot the, overshoots the environmental one, class war and rogue AI. Uh, oops, and then we get to the, the, the actual three images that we found. So, from the 10 years, of, uh, 10 years of scanning, from all the books that we looked at, from l projecting the drivers into these, these archetypes, from doing all that research, it, it basically was synthesized into three major buckets. So, if you will, it's kind of, oh, and this was actually by design, right? So the whole idea of putting the images out there is you hope that somebody's going to bite, right? That if we say that we don't have a positive, compelling image, so let's throw some out there and see if anything sticks. Is the kind of, I mean, is the basic principle, right? So for those who are environmentally inclined, there's the circular commons image. And I'll explain what that means, right? The non-worker's paradise, I mean, I, I wonder about this because one of my other assumptions, and again, this is a little bit more of a U.S.-y thing, but I say anything that says socialism or communism is a dead duck. It has no, it doesn't have a prayer, at least in the U.S. Now, I, I have no problem with either one, but I'm just saying from if we want these images to take, we've got... What will be deadly to the future is if the debate becomes capitalism versus socialism or capitalism versus communism, we're done. It's just not going to, it's, it's too easy, right? And it's not fair, but that's just the way. It, so, I mean, it's almost like, it's, it sounds like a, you know, kind of a branding and marketing thing, but it, we have to shift the conversation off of those, you know, Oh, socialism has a, hasn't worked wherever, you know, like that. If that's the debate, we're done, right? So we want to say, what's a, you know, what are different images? What is something that we haven't? So I think that's a really important idea that we, so even though I'm, I'm so I'm goofing around with the non-workers paradise, but really, it's really the post-work future. All right. One interesting little tidbit about the post-work future. I wrote a piece on it and I published it in the, in a Russian journal, and it's like really taken off. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Like that a post-work future, nobody in the U.S. cares about it, but it's big in a place where uh, allegedly, right, it actually happened, right, in the post-work future. This is kind of interesting. Um, okay, and then, I mean, in that, really that post-work future really talks a, a lot more about the social political f aspects, right? How do we work out the class struggle and inequality and all that kind of stuff? And then the tech-led abundance, which is one, there's a whole series of schools of thought that say we're gonna tech our way out of it. I'm a little skeptical of it, but it, it, could, it could work. Now, one of the things about being, I think, of being a good futurist is you can paint, you can paint a plausible, like George would say, a plausible image of the future. You might not believe it. You might, you just go, ah. or you might not like it. But it's your responsibility to say, hey, it's out there, and it's, and if it, if it passes the plausibility test, we got to try it. So I'm not a big fan of tech-led abundance, but it absolutely is a plausible uh, future, and there are some, so, there, there are some, there is some support for that. All right, so now let's look a little bit closer what those images are. So here's the, the pictures. So, you know, you got to have the pretty pictures. We had a designer put these together. 
Um, and you probably get the hint that this, uh, the idea of the Venn diagram is it may not necessarily be one, like, you know, does it have to be only, you know, post-work future, only circular? Mm, it's probably a little bit of a mix, but for the sake of even, you know, even speaking of these three images, they're very high level, right? I mean, just to talk about an encompassing image, you know, it's is really, it's a, it's a very high level kind of idea. So trying to smush those three into one, uh, maybe that's the next phase, right? But I think each of these three, hopefully it appeals to different groups. They see something in there that says, yeah, I, l I like this. This is something I, you know, I want to do. Okay. So let's actually look at what they, uh, some of the ideas behind them. The, um, this one started out as sustainable commons. And uh, uh, might as well just start, continue, start early being offensive. Because I was like, I, I think sustainability is starting to get, it's, it's, it's a term that I, I don't, I think it's starting to get uh, sullied up by its association with capitalism, right? So this sort of sustainable stuff, we're going to do, you know, it was a great idea, and it's the same thing, right? It was a great idea that had its day, but I, now I'm thinking it's just been kind of overused, ill-used, and it's no fault of no, no fault of the concept of those that support it. But it, I, I kind of feel like it's been co-opted to some degree, and it's no longer talking about a future that we can aspire to. It's just kind of, oh, how do we green up what we're already doing, right? So trying to think of, well, what, if, if that's not a good term, what is? And I can say that every once in a while as a futurist to get excited about an idea. <laughs> Remember, I say I'm usually on board, but this circular stuff, ooh, that's, an, for me, that's what we call that, we get an ooh on the circular. When, that, when, that, when we first started seeing that emerge, and you look at some of the work, particularly by the MacArthur Foundation, but others who picked it up, that's a concept that's got some, I think it's got some oomph. And, and when we start to really figure it out, now they're doing a pretty good job of spreading the word, but... I think that could be that, that big idea that really starts to mobilize, hey, we can create a circular economy. We can do this. Okay, so it's interesting, it's compelling. The commons, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, uh, concepts about you know, how do we manage, uh, manage the resources in common. Um, now, this is why we start to think about 2040, 2050, because I, I am, Talking about the idea of moving away from private property to commons-based approaches, oof, that is going to be hard. Even saying it in a serious forum, right? You just people go, well, geez, you, are, you really don't play in the big leagues here. If you're, you're gonna, you know what I mean? Like if you, if you talk amongst the power structure that we're actually going to start doing things like gift economy, um, grassroots and local, you know, the, the, like George said, the, 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 the decision makers will look at that and go, Pfft, this is just another one of those, right? However, w the other thing that we know as futurists is ideas like that, we just talk about the gift, they always at first seem ridiculous. Like a re so a new compelling idea, you introduce it, power structure goes, <laughs> geez, here we go, another one of those futurists, right? I remember like as an example, I used to talk about uh, early on, just for giggles, I would talk about full unemployment should be the goal of our, our, of our world, right? I remember saying, and then like, say that in the, the 1990s and even the 2000s, and that would be the, you could just see all the brains click off, right? Oh, full unemployment, what do you mean? It's the, it's, it's the wrong concept, right? But again, now, 20 years later, it's starting to look like maybe that, 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 that could be the idea, right? As we, I mean, in the U.S., we had, a, we had a candidate run on a UBI, Universal Basic Income Platform. Same thing. When I mentioned that, that this interest in after capitalism really exploded five years ago. Talking about Universal Basic Income, I'm telling you, for 25 years of my career, that was, again, it was a talk killer. People just said, oh, Jesus. It's, it's polite conversation now. Does anybody, is anybody here think, well, UBI is just, you know, like it, we could, well, you might not agree with it, but it's a very, it's a polite society topic now. And it was not. And I think that's an important thing to think about with this future, uh, this whole idea of exploring the future. When you find a new and interesting idea, you are going to get attacked in the beginning. They're always going to say, 
And if you believe it, now this, not to say you should believe every new idea that you come across, but if you see something and you believe it, stick with it, right? Because time, time, be, time is on your side. Now, we have a whole, we have a whole thing on degrowth today. Or not, I don't know if it's today, but this weekend. Degrowth, 10 years ago, crazy, heretical, awful. Who are these, who are these nutbags talking about degrowth? Polite society now, right? So you got another 20 years, degrowth is going to look like, oh, we're going to have to come up with something. No, I don't know. That 20 years is probably about what we need. But So anyway, a lot of these ideas, again, that started out as crazy are now moving towards the mainstream, towards it. They're not in there. They're moving towards the mainstream. Uh, is there anything else? Reintegrating with nature. So one of the things you get asked is, like, if you, if you could, you know, if you had the magic wand and you could do one thing, in, in the circular commons, to me, the biggest problem we have with our, our relationship with, with nature, climate change, and resource overload and all that, is we, we're just so separated from nature now, we've just lost the plot. But we see nature as some abstract thing that we use, we conquer, we're afraid of it, we stay away from it. And I think if, we, if, if our whole approach to nature was, you know, we're a part of it, not outside of it, I think that, m that mindset flip would be ginormous. That's a technical word that we use here in the U.S. It's a scholarly term, ginormous, right? The, but our relationship with nature is so whacked. It, it's, it's seen as this commodity, this thing to be exploited, right? And if we shifted that, then I think a lot of other ideas would start to come into... All right, and so anyway, some of the key concepts, you see uh, 13 or so of the books that talked about some aspect of this circular commons. My job was to synthesize uh, synthesize them into something semi-coherent. Okay, so that's the first one. Most, uh, I would say the most volume, the most of the scanning signals of change were around this image. This is probably the biggest one of the three. The non-worker's paradise idea. Again, post-work post is the major idea. Um, just yesterday, um, I saw a piece. Uh, you guys remember, you guys heard the book Bullshit Jobs, right? Somebody, uh, it was uh, some pretty mainstream magazine had a piece yesterday about bad jobs. And it actually cited the bullshit jobs. And it was saying, you know, that in a nutshell, the economy has been creating more bad slash bullshit jobs than good jobs. And my little tweet on that was, look, the game, in, in terms of a future in which we try to create good jobs for everybody, that's another one I think, the game is over, we can't impossible it's an assumption right and rather than trying to find a way to find to find jobs for everybody we should go in the other direction and say like instead of creating bullshit jobs get rid of them so where does that lead us did i write it in here yeah it, number two redistribu redistribution you want to think of another idea that's going to get us in some big trouble when we if you if you really want to do something different in capitalism right whole thing is you've got to find out a redistribution of wealth mechanism. Oh my, good, right? That is going to be just attacked unmercifully, right? What are you, you're going to take from me and give to someone else? Yeah. I mean, that's what redistribution is. Now, you know, obviously in Europe, it's a little bit of an easier idea. You guys actually have tax rates and stuff, but <laughs> that redistribute a little bit. We, you know, we don't, right? But I think that's, you know, that's the idea, right? So in a nutshell, what this non-worker's paradise is saying, rather than trying to, you know, it, what is trying to create full employment, trying to create jobs, it's just, it's basically trying to prop up the system that's, that's collapsing, right? So instead, we go to the new system that says, r rather than trying to fix the old one, how do we make it so people will still need to do things still have to do things, but they won't do it um, as a job for a living. Okay, that's the short one. I've got to get moving. All right, this is the th but we're on the third image, so this is good. All right, so tech-led abundance, basically, and I saw the, the um, comment about transhumanism. It's another idea that's been around for a long time, um, but it's getting some play now. It, you know, it started out, the transhumanists are all completely you know, flaky. Not anymore. It's a big society. Okay, no, I, I know I'm, I'm up against it, right? So, 
the essence of the tech-led abundance, all kinds of different ideas that's basically saying that we will be able to, or what I call it, tech, tech fix our way. Technology will save us. I mean, that's the short answer. There's all kinds of reasons you could challenge that, but it's, it's a decent idea, right? I mean, it could happen. What if it does work? We'll create so much wealth. And if you think about it, what's the way to post work? It's tech-led abundance, right? If you could use robotics, automation, AI, and machine learning to do all the work, then we don't have to do it. And if we could figure out how to distribute all that so we don't have to do it, it's, it could happen. Okay, but we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. I'm sure that you... The, the interesting part of this also is it gets into the whole, what's the end game of tech-led abundance? Are we even human anymore, right? But we'll save that for later. All right, so the, uh, let's just do the sum. We'll do this as the summary slide and then get to questions. So I just do a little bit of stuff about pathway. Now, George talked a lot about, you know, the causal pathway, and that, that, is, that is good futures work that says, you know, you have to say, what's your flow? How do you get there? If, if you don't believe the how we get there, then why should we pay attention? So that's good futures work, right? Uh, I, I, play, I, I just pay some cursory attention to that and say, first thing, let's, let's, agree, let's agree on the destination before we build the complete path. Because if nobody gives a crap about the images, why build the pathway, right? So see if the images are worthy and then build the pathway. But all right, there, but there's three things you can do on the way to building an image. You gotta change the mindset. Um, you gotta mess with the rules of the system and then you gotta measure it. And what Donella Meadows did, who came up with this, basically said, how do you change a system? She said, well, we spend most of our time in the numbers, but it actually doesn't do much. It's, it's easy to do, but it doesn't really change much. We change tax rates. Eh, it helps a little bit, but it doesn't really change much. You start to change the rules of the system, hmm, things start to happen, but it's really hard to do. Once you start changing rules, people go, well, wait a second, right? Mindset, ultimately. And that's why I think this is a 20 to 30 year battle, not battle, 20 to 30 year pathway. Is once people say, yes, we should do this, then it all follows, right? And, but it's the hardest thing to do, right? And we all know this. The hardest thing to do is change minds and culture. Yeah, duh, right? Not a new idea, but. And so what, all I would say to kind of wrap that up is what we're, we're trying to think about is how do we do those, you know, do those three things together. Yeah, sure, we should muck with the numbers. We should start to do some of that. We should start to change the rules, and we, we work on the image, or the, uh, sorry, the paradigm, which is you know, part of what we're doing here today. Okay. All right, the, uh, the perils of the sand are here, so um, let me stop there, and we'll open her, open her up for questions.